How does it all end? We're in our fourth part. We've looked at Matthew 6. We've looked at at, uh, Matthew 24. Uh, We're headed toward Revelation. God has mapped it all. Uh, For those of you, I never know who uh, was here last time because I don't take attendance, but opening your Bibles, I'll review the last three hours by showing you three verses. Uh, Matthew 6, starting in verse 9. Gospel by Matthew, chapter 6, verse 9. Jesus said, In this manner, therefore, pray. Uh, The Lord's Prayer has 73 Greek words. 25 of them are about sin and confession, one-third of it. It's it's one of the most intensely concentrated uh, truths. In fact, the Lord's Prayer is the most well-known passage in the world. Over 2 billion people know it by heart. And yet it's the least practiced and understood because it's basically a framework that that centers around this God's kingdom coming, me keeping my eye on the Lord, me living in such a way that I'm dependent on him, he protects me, supplies me, and I humbly serve him. So we looked at that, especially at thy kingdom come part. Then, turn over to Matthew 24, a few chapters later, Jesus gives his closing message. Uh, You notice that chapter 24 and 25 are the last public messages that Jesus gives. Now, they were to the disciples, but they were actually sit-down teaching messages that were recorded. Then all the rest in John 14 onward is just his kind of legacy uh, only for believers. He, he really put that in, and especially parts of it not till after Judas left in the Lord's Supper. But uh, it, notice what it says in chapter 24, verse 8. These are the beginning of sorrows. So Jesus said the end of the world will be these Uh, kind of intensifying birth pains. And look at verse uh, 33 where it says, So you know it is near all things, it's near at the doors. Assuredly, I say unto you, verse 34, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. And then look what Jesus said. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words are not going to pass away. He said the kingdom's coming and heaven and earth are going to be gone, and Peter described it as melting. The earth is uncreated, and so is the whole universe. Uh, Then we get to Revelation. So I've been promising Revelation. Look at Revelation 1, uh, because Revelation is the most unique book in the Bible. It has 404 verses. It alludes to 800 other parts of the Bible, either directly quoting them or pulling words from them or using uh, visuals like, remember, uh, Uh, when Joseph had his dream and saw the sun and moon and stars bowing down to him. That, in chapter 12, is an example of drawing from the book of Genesis. But look at the first two verses of Revelation. The revelation of Jesus Christ. And revelation, apocalypsis, means to make something very clearly seen. So God says, because it says, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave. God wants Jesus Christ to be seen clearly. Now, the last time all of them had seen him, it was a little hazy. I mean, he was meek and mild Jesus that went around teaching but wasn't able to stop his own death. You know, he went to the cross and most of them had this grisly, and and they were just thinking of all that blood. And then they saw him risen and were scared to death and still didn't believe. So God says, I want everybody to have kind of this, this correct picture of Christ. So that's what Revelation is. To show us, his servants, by the way, that's cover to cover, the book of Revelation calls people going to heaven bond slaves of Christ. The word is an absolutely purchased slave in the Roman Empire. That's the word God uses for us. He said, I bought you at a price. You belong to me. You are to be my servant is kind of an elevated term. It's really slave. That's really this word. So to show my slaves, and that's why Paul always addressed in his epistles that he's the slave of Jesus Christ or bond servant as uh, the reformers translated because they felt it was offensive to call people slaves even back in the 16th century. So uh, his servants, things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John who bore witness to the word of God and the testimony of the things which he saw. So the whole purpose of Revelation is in verse 1 to make Christ real clear and to show us how it's all going to end which should change everything. So what we saw next is that there are going to be these birth pains. And they're going to have the, the characteristic of that their frequency is going to get closer and closer together. It's kind of like boom, 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 boom. I mean, it's, it's like 
it just, you can feel it getting closer. They're going to get stronger. They're going to be more widely seen and have an impact on humanity. Until the point where we get in chapter 6 of Revelation that people are crawling in the storm sewers and caves because they're so afraid. And yet they still won't repent, which is amazing. And then what we saw is these trends are all the way through. Remember, this is Jesus' favorite prophet of eschatology. I mean, his favorite quoting prophet was Isaiah. But of all the, of the prophecy prophets, he loved Daniel. He named, it's the only one he names by name of the prophets. And Daniel says that at the time of the end, many shall run to and fro. We looked at the, the explosion of travel. Uh, global knowledge, and I showed you my phone that's more powerful than uh, you know, huge institutional computers were just 15 years ago, and knowledge has increased. And then we talked about weather, and I, I showed you even the little Derrico that came across last year, and how the earth is just going to be shaken by these events. But tonight, the next trend is the global communications explosion. Look, look what Revelation 11 says, and I would read it to you, except... Uh, I want to emphasize, that's why I put them in red. When the two witnesses, remember God has three waves of witnessing going on. The, the tribulation is the most gospel-centric time in history. And, and God sends, first of all, the 144,000 literal ethnic Jews, normal humans. They're people saved, that they're alive on earth, that are saved and sealed and and protected by God and deployed, kind of like special forces. That's the first wave. The second wave are uh, the two witnesses, which we don't know who they are. And there's been speculation. Usually it, it narrows down to Moses, Elijah, or Enoch. And they like Elijah and Enoch because, you know, they were both transported to heaven. Yet Moses and Elijah were at the transfiguration. It's probably them. But God didn't tell us, I guess, so we had something to talk about. But the beast from the abyss, the, the Antichrist, kills them. And look what it says. Those from the peoples and tribes and tongues and nations. Now, every time we hear that, you know, we're supposed to go into all the world and share the gospel with every creature. And then all of a sudden in Revelation, we see those of every tongue and tribe and nation and kindred. And This is speaking of a vast amount of earth starts seeing their dead bodies. How many people can really see someone's dead body? I mean, we put a president in state, and you can only walk so many people by there to see it. But all of a sudden, what we see is something is different. For three and a half days, and verse 10 says, those who dwell on the earth will rejoice. Within the three and a half day period, everybody on earth knows about it. So obviously, there is some global communications explosion. Now, this, we didn't even know what the whole Earth looked like until we got satellites. Isn't it interesting what maps looked like when they were mapping from boats? Then we got airplanes. And then all of a sudden, when we got satellite maps, they had to correct a lot of things because it was always computing. You know, we, we had to measure the miles. But all of a sudden that we got this view like God has, it changed everything. Well, all of a sudden, now we see that that means we're in a whole new era where events can be seen and heard globally and now instantaneously. And those who dwell on the earth, look at this, Amazon is still there. Do you see that in verse 10? What are they doing? What does it say? They're sending what? All over the earth. No, I'm serious. This is, this is serious. The Bible is saying there's going to be a way to see everything. Everybody on earth seeing an event and everybody on earth responding to it and sending. I don't know if they're sending gifts like emails or texts or TikTok videos or actually ordering on Amazon but, or whatever is you know, there then because those two died. Well, speaking of uh, all that, did you know if Netflix was a country, it would be bigger than Bangladesh and Russia? And There are 203, well about a month ago, 203 million accounts on Netflix. Most people don't have an account just for themselves because it costs $14.99, and so they share it with their family. Do you know what this means? This means that probably over a billion people are subscribing to Netflix. I don't promote it. Uh, it's the greatest purveyor of demonism and materialism and sensuality and everything else. But 
the world is watching it, and it's, it's huge. Um, but look at the other one you've heard of, Facebook, or it's Meta now. Did you know yesterday at 4.30, the green dots are people that were using their phone to broadcast live. And it's filled with these little, everyone's competing to have a little clip of something that goes viral. I thought viral was bad. You got sick from viruses, but it means to spread wide and fast. But look at all the green dots. I mean, all over southeastern United States, up through Chicago, I see Michigan has some. I mean, from the UK all the way over into Turkey, they're there. Look at Thailand. The whole country is just about green. Uh, Vietnam is green. It's China, they're even. Ooh, Korea is really China a little bit. Uh, Philippines is big, but see all the green? Those are the people broadcasting. They're showing you the weather. They're showing you their daughter hula hooping or whatever. What are the other color? Those are the people that are watching it. That was yesterday on Facebook at 4.30 in the afternoon. Can you imagine when those two witnesses are killed? Everybody's got their phone and they're talking. I'm standing here and their bodies are here. <gasps> One of them's sitting up. <gasps> Can you imagine? The whole world is watching the resurrection of the two witnesses. So it's, it's happened. Did you know that happened? Because the smartphone started. What year was that, by the way? When did everybody have a computer in their pocket? 07. Did you know that's only 14 years ago? And everything has changed. Everything. Um, to the point that, look at this, 73% of all adults in America can't imagine going a whole day without the screen. And you know what God says you're going to have to learn because in Revelation 18, he turns them all off. He turns off the music, he turns off the electricity, he turns off everything. And it's going to drive people crazy. It's the crescendo. The mark of the beast is a literal mark on people's hands and foreheads. And the, the word that John used was exactly, remember the first law of interpretation, the first, theologically we call it, the first canon of textual interpretation is that the audience that received the word of God as the initial recipients is the primary way to interpret any passage of scripture. What did the apostle John communicate to the seven churches that Jesus wanted him to communicate 2,000 years ago, how did they understand his words? That's the, the highest form of interpretation. That's your first level. Everything else is lesser. That's the word used for the mark that every prostitute had in her brothel. They were marked. And you could tell where they were from. It's the mark every soldier had. They were tattooed with the... Set, you know, SPQR, the Senate, the Senate and the pop, or the SPQR uh, of Rome, uh, the Senate and the whatever the P is of Rome, was on every Roman legionnaire, SPQR. It's also what every slave had. You bought slaves like you bought a blender. You'd go to the market and you'd get number 131. In fact, slaves didn't even have names. Do you know how a slave was named? By his birth order. You can see that in the Bible. Paul said, and Quartus greets you, and so does Tertius. Do you know what Tertius means? Third. What does Quartus mean? Fourth, right? So you see, slaves didn't even have names. They were numbers. First, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth born, and they were tattooed with their number at the slave market. So you could say, I bought 31, you know, and then at home you'd say, what's your name? And he'd say, I was, I was third. Okay, Tertius, go do this. Go wash the clothes. So this word is a literal mark. So, yes, it, people get microchips. Does that mean they're getting the mark of the beast? No. Will the Antichrist use a microchip? I don't know. Probably. But no one is going to take the mark of the beast unknowingly, according to the Bible. It's going to be a willful marking to either join the legions, either to be put into a house of prostitution, or to become a slave those people knew they were marked, they knew they were giving allegiance to someone, and that's what the Antichrist does. But look how he does it. And it's a number that you can't buy or sell with except one who has the mark of the name or the number of his name. So what it's talking about is digitalized money that you can't buy or sell unless he authorizes it, 
But it's tied with this number. Now, do you know what all of us have done? We've all started using credit cards. We've all started opening accounts that have account numbers. We've all started letting our money go digitally. And because of that, look what has happened. With all of that on their right hand or forehead, in order to secure all this electronic money that you can't see, it's not a bag of grain, it's not a pile of coins, we have allowed ourselves, whether you know it or not, uh, right now about 200 million of Americans have been scraped off the internet and your faces are in the Palo Alto company that does this for the government and your faces have joined everybody else's faces and are become a part of this biometric identification. I mean, India's doing it for their elections. They're biometrically identifying all the billion, 200 million Indians. China already has it completely. I mean, you can walk down the street and jaywalk in Shanghai, and at your home, on a billboard, it will say, Bill Yang jaywalked, because the cameras see you wherever you are in the city and know where you live, and they publicly shame you at home so that your neighbors will say, Bill Yang, why did you jaywalk downtown? And you go, oh, I won't do it anymore. Well, it's come out. Facial recognition is probably second in America only to China. Only China has more facial recognition than we do. It has tied together all those traffic cams. I mean, basically what you see on Jason Bourne, you know, all those, those thrillers, is not even as much as is really going on. They actually, if you read this article, this is a fascinating article on this. Uh, uh, that was in MSNBC, but it's from Wired. Wired says it's unbelievable the level of computing they've got where they actually know people that are on parole and they're tracking them through the major cities. And the American Civil Liberties Union is starting to file a lot of suits about this because you know what they're saying? It's discriminatory because so many percent of the people that are on parole are, you know, this racial identity. And so most of the people that they're tracking are also, and so it's very discriminatory. But the police have found it fantastic. Because when there's a robbery, they already know the eight people that are on parole that were actually on that street, and they go get them, and they find out which one really did the robbery. It's, it's a little frightening to think about. Uh, look, there's Bonnie's doorbell right there, the upper left, that's tracking who's visiting. If you buy a car, if you're in a rental car, of course they're tracking every place you go. They'll even call you. My son rented a car to go visit his grandfather had Alzheimer's, and he crossed too many states, and a U.S. Marshal met him at an exit somewhere and said, what are you doing, son, with this car? He said, I'm going to see my grandpa in upstate New York. And he said, but you've driven all the way from Colorado. He says, yeah, I couldn't afford the airplane. They went, okay. They knew right where, they knew what exit he was at. And they, because cars, and the newer car you have, the more trackable it is, and your business cars have it in it. And then look at all those things, Alexa and everything else over there that's listening all the time. I mean, Bonnie and I rent cars all over the world. You know, we drive in 30 different countries. And I was talking to Bonnie, and I turned and I said, no, uh, you have a couple of unanswered emails. And the car said, unanswered emails will search. And I said, did you turn that on? She said, no, the car was listening. I don't even remember what country we were in when that happened. And I thought, wow. And look, on the right, your phone is always tracking your location. And, and the phone company, now they're starting during the Capitol riots. They knew right, all they had to do is subpoena those records from 9X or Verizon or whatever they're called. And they knew right where everybody, where their phone was at least. And all of that reminds us that Revelation 13 said 2,000 years ago, the world leader called the Antichrist is going to say, mm, you can't buy or sell if you don't have my mark, if you don't have allegiance to me, I'm cutting off your digital money. China's gone a step further. They launched a new app where you can report people for expressing mistaken opinions. Now just wait until what we believe is a mistaken opinion. And people that hate Christ and Christianity and the exclusivity of the gospel can say, I overheard at Panera two ladies talking. The one lady implied the other lady was a sinner. That's negative. And you can report mistaken opinions 
in China. I bet it won't be long, we'll copy that. And of course, while we weren't looking, even though it's crashed a few times, cryptocurrency is now worth more than all US currency in circulation. People love digital money. They love having it it's so encrypted and so everything and blockchained that you can't get under their mattress and dig a hole through whatever and steal their money. That it is, it is more secure, they feel. And that's going to play right into this. Well, I just got this yesterday, look, March 7th, Russia sanctions. Tech cutoff was bad. You know, we banned them from Netflix and Prime and, you know, who needs that? You can go get a DVD. And we, we blocked them from, you know, being able to be tweeting and everything else. But when Visa and MasterCard were suspended to the Russians, it's unbearable. So they're going to swap over to Chinese card service. That's what they said yesterday. Did you catch that? Because America doesn't like, whether it's moral or immoral or right or wrong, because America doesn't like what Russia's doing, we control not only Visa and, and MasterCard, but most of the financial transactions of the world flow through, as you know, Omaha, Nebraska. It's the great clearinghouse of all credit transactions. It's not the stock exchange and it's not the commodity. But personal credit, Omaha is the hub. And it goes through there in, in amazing trillions of dollars. And we just said, on the map, anybody that's inside the Russian thing, there goes your Visa and MasterCard. And that is probably the single strongest jolt. All of a sudden, the Russians said, something's up. No one's ever done this before. It's just the start of the capabilities. OK, here's another one. The seventh trend are the weapons of global human death and destruction. This is what Jesus said. Uh, there will be great tribulation, such as not been since the beginning of the world to this time, nor ever shall be. This is a unique event, the tribulation. And unless those days were shortened, no humans, no flesh would be saved. Wow. Now you notice that it's talking about the destruction of human bodies, all the different ways. Okay, let's think about that. Remember, everybody used to, I mean, I was, I was saved in 1962 because I finally put two and two together. I was very aware I was a sinner, but I wasn't afraid of anything soon impending doom until they made us crawl under our desk every day and practice putting our hands like this to get ready for the Russians sending atomic bombs on our little school in Hazlitt, Michigan. And all of a sudden, I went home and I said to my mom, I said, they're talking to us about we might get bombed. She said, mm-hmm. And that night, she did the Bible story the same way she'd done it every night that I had known growing up. She would read our Bible story, and our whole family would be there. My mom would read it, and at the end, she'd say, and Karen is going to heaven, and Sharon is going to heaven, and Johnny's not. And I used to always just say, mm, I'm going to bed. And it didn't bother me a bit until that night. And I sat there, and I went, what did you just say? And she smiled. She said, you were listening, weren't you? The getting under your desk and covering your head scared you enough that you're listening, aren't you? And she took me into the only quiet room in our house because we only had one, two, three, four, five rooms. And the only room in our house was the bathroom, the fifth room. And she shut both doors and put her Bible on the toilet and made me get on my knees in front of the toilet. I'd only done that when I vomited, so it was really a <laughs> big experience. And, and open to John 3.16 and led me to Christ because of the left. But look, you know, this is a satellite picture from last month. That is a, a field of ICBMs the Chinese are building. And the Chinese are actually ahead of us right now. Hypersonic missiles. Theirs, just a few weeks ago, went around the Earth four times, 100,000 miles. It went... <laughs> and then hit its target. It was traveling like unbelievably, unstoppably fast. And look at that. That's just one of their nuclear sites. Uh, another thing that recently happened, do you remember last uh, August or whenever it was? When, um, No, last May, I see it was. When the first artificial intelligence war was fought on Earth. Everyone was complaining because Israel was not suffering casualties. Israel wasn't losing anything. They weren't losing tanks. They weren't losing planes. They weren't losing soldiers. They were shooting down every missile that was coming except a couple. I think they had a 99 point something percent or 98. 
And, and the world was saying, this is a lopsided war. And they finally confessed. Their operation against Hamas was the world's first artificial intelligence war, and they let the machines dictate everything, where the missiles hit, what ones they knocked out, where their soldiers went, and they totally analyzed and actually ran circles around Hamas. It was unbelievable. It was, I mean, it's sad, it's warfare, it's death, it's destruction, it's whatever, but it was a whole new arena. And then, uh, uh, let's see, what month is that? That's August. That was the biggest deployment of our Navy. All the red are, are all of our fleets, you know, the first and the seventh. I'm not Navy, but they're all the sixth fleet, all that stuff. And it was war games, but look at the headlines. The biggest U.S. Navy war games in 40 years to prepare for World War III. That was last August. World War III, across 17 time zones, amid tensions with, now that's the important part, I put it in red, Russia, China, and Iran. Why is that important? Because the final war that's in Revelation 16 involves the armies of the East, China, and, you know, whoever else, Korea, at least North Korea will be with them. Who, I don't know who else. I don't know when this is going to happen, but China for sure, and Iran and Russia. God identifies in chapter 38. Uh, before Ukraine, these were the headlines we had. Putin is deploying fearsome Russian robot armies. See those little missiles on the side? Well, we started watching them. I mean, this was the first day. You remember that headline? Countdown to World War III, Russia missile blitz. Oil was at 100. It's a lot higher than that now. But I wrote, seeing the future God has written down. We're seeing it unfold, this amplification of wars. But pretty soon, this was the next day's headline. Those are hyperbaric missiles. What does that mean? That means they, they emit a little stream of vaporized petro uh, gasoline, and then they ignite it. And this, I mean, not, it's thermobaric, sorry, not hyperbaric. Those are the chambers you sit in to get extra oxygen. Uh, this is thermobaric. And that concussive blast sucks all the oxygen out of the air, combusts it with the, the vapor of the gasoline, and actually explodes people internally. It's a banned weapon, what I should say. It's gross. But on the left, it shows that's what they were driving in convoys and bringing in from Belarus and from Crimea and everything to use on the Ukrainian people. And God says, watch out. The wars and rumors of wars are just going to get stronger and stronger, and we're seeing it. But it's not just warfare. Look at this. It says in Revelation 9, but the rest of mankind who were not killed by the plagues, you know, all the, the uh, horsemen and demons, didn't repent of worshiping the demons or the idols, and they didn't repent of their murders. Now look at this headline. When is that? April 16th. American Horror Story. Map reveals where 54 mass shootings erupted over the past month. As a CNN host says, there's not an active shooter situation, yes. Philadelphia, Essex, Baltimore, Norfolk, Virginia Beach, Wilmington, all of those had mass shootings in one month here. Now, we're not the murder capital of the world, but we have a lot of murders in America. What does Revelation say? That's what's going to be, it's, it's not going to just be 54 active shooter mass shootings in America, it's going to be the whole world gets to the point where kind of like the COVID fatigue has made people have road rage and every other kind of rage, the, the closing in of the end of the tribulation is going to make people rise up and just be murderous to each other. And it also says they won't repent of their sorceries. And that word sorcery, Greek, pharmakeia, has to do with drug-induced opening the mind to demonic things. That's what sorcery means. It involves drugs demons, and the human body, and the gateway opening up through the pharmacia, through the drug. So that's part of this list of these five sins of Revelation 9. I thought it was curious that Oregon decriminalized the usage of what used to be criminal penalty drugs. And they just said, hey, come to Oregon and shoot up here. You know? And they're now having safe zones and giving you a fresh, I mean, what are you cooking up? We'll give you a fresh syringe for it. And I don't mean to be mocking, but this is where we're going. 
I mean, we already know Amsterdam was like that, but now we have a whole American state that has become not just marijuana. We're talking about hard, opiate, drug intravenous, amazing drug addiction. And then I thought this was amazing. It says at the end, after all those horrible things, demons and murders and sorceries and sexual immorality, or of their thefts. Remember San Francisco? It's been in the news constantly. The new DA decriminalized anything under, what is it, 2000 or 1000 or $1,200. If what you stole didn't cost more than $1,200, the police can't touch you. Smash and grab covered San Francisco, and it's going a lot of other places. This is the famous viral video of a guy coming on his bicycle and, and pedals through the store, filling a bag, adding it up, keeping under 1000 and drove out. That's where we've come to. That's, that is the tribulation uh, flashing light. That a society can degenerate to the point that a few of us pay for stuff and more and more people keep it under 1,000. Then, number eight is the trend of global peace and prosperity and materialism. Do you remember what brings the Antichrist? And do you remember when the Antichrist comes, there's going to be a pause and this temporary global euphoria of peace. That's what the white horse is, and he comes with no bow and arrow. Without warfare, he brings peace to the earth. It's people are going to be so desiring peace. They want safety. Uh, they, they just want to be happy and prosperous and have stuff. Well, I think it's amazing. Let me just show you a couple things. This is the capital, the market valuation of Apple computer. It's $2.1 trillion, which is more than all but seven countries of the world. There are only seven countries whose GDP, gross domestic product, is higher than the value of one, of, of a telephone company, of a computer company. Uh, number one is U.S., we're 22 trillion. Uh, number two is China, 16.8 trillion. Japan's 5 trillion. GDP, Germany's 4.2. UK's 3.1. India's 2.9. And France is 2.9. And the next one after that's Italy, and Apple is bigger than the entire gross domestic product of Italy. Steve Jobs, unbelievable. And it, by the way, it, it's um, astounding, their manufacturing and everything they're doing. I mean, this is Amazon. Amazon's only 1.7 trillion. It's bigger than, well, it's bigger than Korea, it's bigger than Australia, that's bigger than Spain and Mexico and India and Netherlands and Saudi Arabia, Turkey and Chile and a lot of others. In fact, uh, of the 190 countries of the United Nations, Amazon is bigger than 180 of them. Unbelievable where we've gotten. But look at this. Talk about prosperity. We've gotten to the point where the richest 1% have 48% of every dollar the next 19%, the normal average you know, working people have uh, 46%, and the poorest 80% of human beings share 5%. Now, we have a balcony and a main floor. Imagine the main floor is 80% of all the world, and I can assure you all of us sitting here tonight belong in the balcony. We're, we're somewhere in the blue or the red. Do you know why? You have to make $800 a year or less to be in the green. Do any of you, even on Social Security, make less than $800? I don't think so. A year? How do you think the green slice living down here in the flatland, how do you think they look at us up in the balcony who have 80% of the food, 80% of the money, 80% of the electronics, 80% of the medical care? How do you think that plays on the main floor. You understand? It's like we're in the box seats that are air conditioned and they're down here swatting flies and sweating and looking up. Have you ever been to a football game and looked up at the, or a baseball game and looked at all those corporate boxes where they're eating and having shrimp cocktail and drinking and everything else? Think about, that's where we've gotten to in the world. And this especially is touching to me because I'm preparing, I'm soon going to be teaching through the minor prophets, you know, all 12 of them. It's very convicting to teach through the minor prophets and to see what God says the responsibility of the wealthy is to those who are impoverished. So that's part of the 
the whole dynamic. If you notice, the book of Revelation says there's still going to be the uber-rich that are having their ivory and their gold and their everything else while everybody's starving to death. They don't seem to ever get touched until chapter 18. But then the global hatred for Israel. Zechariah tells us that in the tribulation, Jerusalem will be a heavy stone for all peoples, for the whole world. And, I will, uh, and all who lift it will surely hurt themselves, everybody who's trying to do some damage to Israel. But look at that last line. And all the nations of earth will gather against it. We're going to come to the point where there is universal hatred of Israel. Look at headlines like this. Uh, July, well, that was, you know, four years ago, but I, that's only because I didn't give you one from today. They do it every day. Top Iranian general says, our forces in Syria are just awaiting orders and we'll destroy Israel. That anybody can say that out loud and no one challenge it? And do you know who's going to be the primary supporter of Iran doing that? The one that's rampaging in Ukraine right now. In fact, the U.S. government divided up the new Cold War. The green are all those in the Iranian and Russian orbit right now. Notice, you know, Yemen is rocketing Saudi Arabia. And for some reason, you know, uh, Jordan and Saudi Arabia and UAE and Bahrain are, are, are trying to not be against them. But the final trend, not only global hatred of Israel, is global evangelism. Do you know what the Lord says? All the world, all the nations, all the nations. Did you know up until modern times we didn't even know all the world or all the nations? Look what the IMB, that's the uh, International Mission Board of the Southern Baptists, they constantly are updating this map. The red dots are the unreached people groups. That means there's no one in that language group that is a Christian, and there's no scripture in that group, so they are unreached. There's no one that speaks their language that's a Christian that can go in. There's no one that's been able to get the scriptures into their language. And that, those dots are diminished rapidly because more and more and more young people and, and not so young people are taking up the, the task of getting the, the Wycliffe translation of the scripture into every language and tongue and tribe and nation. And when Bonnie and I go to these special conventions of the uh, closed country missionary doctors, much of it's being done through medical missions. And when we go there, we hear about how they put a hospital right next to a cluster of those red dots, and then the Wycliffe translators, whose wife is a nurse, the husband goes out and works with the village. And the country they're in knows they're doing it, but they say, if you're going to let Franklin Graham drop another one of those nice hospitals in our place. We're kind of going to overlook it. As long as you don't go out with a megaphone and start preaching and proselytizing, as long as you keep it down, and they're letting them do it. And the gospel is going, and those red dots are diminishing. Well, real quickly, let's turn to the last verse, and then we're going to go. It's 731. Look at Hebrews chapter 10. It's one of my favorite verses because you always wonder... How do you apply all that? I mean, all that horrible stuff you just said, and, you know, I don't want to live in Oregon, and, you know, what am I supposed to get as an application? God applies it for us, and I don't have to. It's Hebrews 10, 24 and 25. And notice what it says. Um, Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. That is supposed to be the goal of every born-again Christian every time they get around another Christian. I told you that Greek word is paroxysm. The Greek word means to, to convulse someone, kind of like the paddles, you know, get them back the way they're, get them operating and functioning and alive. How do you do that? Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see, what does your Bible say? What day? The day, yeah, the day. The day that Christ returns, the day that he launches this global offensive against humanity, the closer that looks, and boy, those those early Christians thought they were in it. I mean, when Nero started wrapping Christians up in, in animal skins and dipping them in tar and lighting them to alive, burning them to light his banquets, people thought that he was the Antichrist, and they thought that the end of the world had come. And then when it got worse and they moved him to the the huge Circus Maximus in Rome, that's the spot that witnessed more martyrdoms than any place on earth because for centuries they were 
marching them out and massacring them in the Circus Maximus. They thought they were in the end of the world. So what did they do? Did they, did they you know, fight the Romans and try and beat them? Did they, did they hide out? No. They started gathering and stirring one another up. And they said, we don't know when the day is going to be. We don't know when the Lord is going to come in and, and ride in on that white horse and stop all this. But we are going to peroxize one another. How do you do that? Well, basically, it hasn't changed. We all need undistracted time listening to God by feeding on his word. We have to be reading the Bible. So you know what you need? When I was a youth pastor, I made a deal with my, I had 100 in my youth group. I was at Bob Jones University. I was in charge of their on-campus high school, resident dorm student high school kids. I had all the boys, 100 and maybe 10 of them. And, and I've said, every time I see you, I know every one of you by name, on this 260-acre campus, I'm going to walk straight toward you and I'm going to look you in the eye and say, where did you read the Bible this morning? What, what, what did you read? I would be walking across campus and I'd see one of my kids coming toward me and they'd go right up that sidewalk. <laughs> it's like they'd almost you know, put their neck out of joint. And I knew why. Can you guess why? They hadn't read. Hour or two later, I'd be walking between classes. They would... They would they were going to run into me. They would stand and block me, and I'd just walk right by like I didn't see them. they go, aren't you going to ask me? i say, ask you what? What I was reading in the Bible. i said, oh, was I supposed to ask you that? Is that why you did that hard left on me a couple hours ago? Did you know you can stir people up? I don't mean be mean. I don't mean be you know, nauseous and in their face. Just say, hey, God's transformed my life. How about daily time applying God's word? It's not just enough to read it because we are merely hearers of the word. We're supposed to be what? And doers means that we're finding stuff because there are all problems we're struggling with and we're finding verses about that. And someone that's further down the road than me might have already found a verse. I like what Ray Stedman used to do at Palo Alto at Peninsula Bible Church. What he'd do when someone got saved and, and they'd say, hey, this person's a heroin addict and he just got saved. He'd say, oh, come here. Mike used to be. He wasn't. But, but Ray would say, Mike used to be a heroin addict. Go sit by Mike. He'll tell you how... All the temptations that the devil's going to bring, he overcomes. And then someone else come in. They say, oh, they were an alcoholic. Oh, alcoholic. Sue. Come on, Sue weren't, yeah. And a couple other people say, we were too. And they'd all go together. People weren't ashamed of something that they'd already been forgiven and cleansed of. To whom much is forgiven, the same what? Loves much. And they're willing to help others. So how are you focusing time on applying God's word to your life? That's how you peroxize someone. Uh, how about always keeping God on the line? You ever been to the store, you know, and you're trying to check out, and they're talking on the phone, they go, oh, just a second, and they set it down, they check you out, and then they go, yeah, someone was here. And I did. They can't stop talking on their phone or whatever they're doing. Did you know that's how we're supposed to go through life? Pray. It's the only thing we're supposed to do ceaselessly. What is it? Pray without what? Do we? Unless we really need the Lord. Much need, much prayer, little need, little prayer. Finally, this is the one that would transform us. If every gathering of every local church in the world, a part of it was the people didn't talk about where they were going to lunch and their new car and what their crews are going to go on and you know how much they don't like that candidate running for whatever. Instead, they said, hey, when's the last time you got to give a verbal testimony of Jesus Christ? When did you pass out the track last the last time I did was, and, and it's really hard for me, but I'm praying and I bought this new track and I'm trying this. That would transform churches because did you know you can go to a church for a lifetime and never really do anything? It's like you're being trained, but no one checks up on whether you're doing it. So the bottom line is this. Are you part of a group that asks you, what are you reading and feeding your soul upon from God's word? Don't forsake that assemblage. This is not being a spectator in a church this size. That's a wonderful thing, but it doesn't cut it. Because you can slip in as a pastor, I've seen it. People slip in, and as soon as you say, in conclusion, they're leaving because they aren't going to get near anybody. What God wants us to do is have people we can't get away from. Maybe they're in our home, maybe we're married to them, maybe whatever, we work with them or we're students together. But we say, what are you eating? What are you chewing on? Quote me a verse you're memorizing. They say, I have so much trouble. You say, I do too. But you just persist at it because it's the only way 
that I can be changed in the likeness of Christ. What are you breathing? It says that prayer is like breathing to God. What are you praying? What are you beseeching or begging God for? The, the word beseech means to beg. Do we ever beg him for anything? Other than during elections that our candidate wins? I mean, we should be begging God. I mean, for a lot of things. And who are you seeking and sharing the gospel with? The way, whoop, the way that we can live for God anywhere at any time, no matter what is happening around us, because it worked at the worst times for Christianity. An extinction-level event took place for three centuries where the entire might of the Roman Empire was arrayed against Christianity, and they hunted down every pastor, they destroyed every complete copy of the Bible, they destroyed every meeting place. If the church met in your house, it was destroyed. I remember speaking in Jordan, and now I'm nine minutes over again. I was speaking in Jordan to a group of pastors from Egypt and from Iraq and all over the place through the Jordan Evangelical Theological Seminary. And I talked to one man, his name was uh, Moody. That was how he said his name from Egyptian. I said, like DL? He said, yeah, that's what my mom was thinking when she named me that. But he said, I'm a church planner. He said, I'm in lower Egypt. And I said, great, how's it going? He says, oh, he said, the only problem is every time the police find out they burn the house we're meeting in. Not with the people in. They don't massacre them. They just say it's against Egyptian law for you to have a house church. So if you're having a house church there, we're going to burn your house. And the police come, they evacuate the people, whatever you can carry at the moment, and they burn it. Would you sign up to host the next? <laughs> Honestly. Do you want your trailer burned? Are you that committed? That's why the church in Egypt is flourishing. The people are all talking. They have like four or five ahead. And when they burn this one, they already know that the next choice is that person's house. And by the way, you, you not only host the church, but the people of the burnt houses move in with you. That's getting stirred up. And that's how it all ends. And that's the end of the birth pains. And when we come back, Lord willing, if he is still tarrying, we'll be in Revelation 1 tomorrow. Let's bow forward to prayer. Father, I pray that we would consider one another to stir up love and good works. And so much the more as we see that day approaching. And we do see it approaching, so I pray that you would stir our hearts to just do the basics, to just be in your word and to let you change us and to be crying out to you for help and trying to share the gospel and being honest and transparent with one another and saying it's really hard. Pray for me and seeing each other as we agonize together until that day. In the name of Jesus we pray and all God's people said... Amen.